and welcome to the Biddeford Parsonage Museum, historical residence of Lucy Maud Montgomery during 1894-95. Come in, relax, and join us for story time with Ellen Montgomery. I'm Tiana Trousdale, and today I'm going to be reading The Gold Link Bracelet, the story of a girl's inordinate love of finery by Ellen Montgomery, written August 1897 and published in Philadelphia Times, 26th of September, 1897. When Aunt Marion came to visit the Bells in the pretty village home, both Muriel and her sister Flo were in a flutter of delight. Aunt Marion was Uncle Fred's wife, and they had never seen her before. At first, they felt somewhat shy, for she was very stylish and pretty. But their shyness soon wore off, for they found her very kind-hearted and amiable. She delighted the girls with her lively ways and her good comradeship, and one of their great pleasures was to go to her room and gaze at all the pretty things she had to show them. Her rich, dainty dresses and hats, her fans and parasols, her laces, and her jewelry. This last was what Muriel liked best to see, for she had a weakness for trinkets, and Aunt Marion had such beautiful things, sparkling diamond rings, a pearl brooch, an opal pin, a hair dagger set with turquoises, a gold neck chain with a heart-shaped locket, and many others. But what Muriel admired most was a gold bracelet. This was of exquisite workmanship with slender closed links and a little padlock set with a monogram in pearls. I value this more than anything else I have, I think, said Aunt Marion as she sat with her jewel box on her lap and Muriel and Flo on the floor beside her. Not so much because of its beauty or value, but because Father gave it to me the last Christmas I spent at home, and he died soon afterwards. I would not lose it for the world, and I seldom wear it. She had clasped it on her wrist as she spoke, and Muriel's eyes lingered on it wistfully. What would she not have given for a bracelet like that? I am not at all sure that Aunt Marion's display of dresses and pretty things was just the best thing for Muriel, although Aunt Marion herself had no thought beyond giving her young friends a pleasure. She did not dream that it might induce certain little demons of envy and discontent to creep into their hearts. It did not hurt Flo in the least, for she was a sensible, intelligent, contented girl who enjoyed looking at pretty things for their own sake and never thought of feeling covetous or discontented on account of them. But Muriel was very different. She was a pretty brown-eyed girl of 15, and she wanted a great many things that she did not, and could not, and perhaps ought not to have. Before Aunt Marion's advent, she had been very fairly well contented with her own simple, pretty gowns and hats, and the little pin and brooch that were her only jewelry. But her simple finery seemed very poor, and insignificant beside Aunt Marion's city splendors. Flo could put on her new gingham and walk serenely down the street with Aunt Marion in her summer silk and enjoy herself thoroughly. But Muriel could not. Foolish? Yes, of course she was foolish. It is always foolish, and may be wicked as well, to let thoughts about our clothes or envy of someone else's interfere with our comfort and happiness. Muriel thought entirely entirely too much about the bracelet of Aunt Marion's, and sighed whenever she thought of it. If only she had one like it, how all the girls at school would envy her. When Muriel went into Aunt Marion's room with fresh towels the next day, she found herself alone. Aunt Marion's jewel casket lay open upon the dressing table, and there, in its box, on a bed of perfumed pink cotton, lay the dainty thing itself. Muriel picked it up a little doubtfully and fastened it on. She had a pretty wrist, and the bracelet became it. Oh, I do wish it were mine, she said despondently. I've always wanted a bracelet so much, and chains are all the rage now. I might as well wish for the moon, though, as for one like this. It must have cost a great deal. She unlocked it and put it back with a sigh, but she did not leave with it her discontented longing. She carried that with her wherever she went, and she slipped in to peep at the bracelet a great many more times than she ought when Aunt Marion was out, forgetting that the first stage on the road of temptation is a very gradual one indeed. One day, Muriel received a little note from Clara Howard, 
inviting her to a birthday heart party the following evening. Flo was not invited, as she was not in Clara's class at school. But she did not feel disappointed over it, for she and Aunt Marion had planned to drive to the city the next day to visit Aunt Isabel, and they intended to remain overnight. Muriel was in a flutter of expectant delight. She enjoyed parties, and Clara Howard's were always delightful, for Clara's father was rich and denied her nothing. She was sure of having a good time, and she had a pretty new dress to wear to it. Besides, her father gave her a new pair of slippers for it, and Brother Charlie brought her the very prettiest silver belt buckle imaginable. Muriel dressed alone that night, missing Flo's skill and aid not a little, but very pretty. Indeed, she looked when she finished her simple toilet and stepped back with a bit of pardonable vanity to smile at her radiant reflection. But it takes a great deal to satisfy some people, and Muriel was not satisfied. She wanted a bracelet. All the girls at the party would have one, and she felt decidedly ill-used because she could not have one too. Then Muriel thought of the gold link bracelet in Aunt Marion's box. Oh, if she could only wear that to Clara Howard's party, how the girls would envy her. When people allow ideas like this to take possession of their minds, they very often get into trouble. Muriel should have resolutely banished such thoughts, but she did not. Instead, the foolish girl went into Aunt Marion's room and looked lovingly at the little heap of shining links lying on the pink cotton. I'm sure it would not hurt to wear it just tonight, she murmured. I dare say if Aunt Marion were here, she would let me if I asked her. I'd be just as careful as I possibly could be, and nobody need ever know. I'll put it right back in the box whenever I come home. I know Mother wouldn't allow me if she knew, but I'm sure it's not a bit of harm. Which last speech was a pretty certain sign that there was harm in it. Muriel knew very well that what she was doing was a wrong thing but she refused to look the ugly thought in the face, and she hurriedly took the bracelet from the pink nest and clasped it around her arm. The little padlock fastened with a spring, but could be unlocked only by the little gold key lying beside it in the box. It isn't a single bit of harm, Muriel repeated as she admired the effect. But nevertheless, she flushed very guiltily 10 minutes later in her own room and quickly shoved the bracelet up out of sight under the lace frill of her sleeve when her mother came in to inspect her. Half an hour afterwards, she was the center of a group of laughing girls in Clara Howard's dressing room. Her gold link bracelet was noticed and pounced on immediately by the keen-eyed Bevy. A buzz of admiration and questioning arose. Oh, Muriel, where did you get such a lovely thing? was the burden of the chorus. But Muriel only smiled mysteriously and refused to say anything about it. Each of the girls privately concluded that Muriel's rich aunt must have given it to her and envied her in proportion. But Muriel felt very ill at ease and honestly wished that the gold link bracelet was safe at home in Aunt Marion's jewel box. In the first place, she had not had a minute's peace of mind since she left home lest it should slip off her arm in some way and be lost. Then suppose Aunt Marion should come back that night after all and miss it before Muriel got home. When Muriel came to think it over, she could not be certain that Aunt Marion and Flo had really decided to stay away all night. They had only talked of it. This worried her, and moreover, under all these bubbles of discomfort was the secret conviction that she had done a very mean and unladylike thing, something that Aunt Marion and her mother and Flo would terribly disapprove. Muriel hated the very sight of the gold link bracelet before the evening was over, if she could have taken it off, she would, but the little gold key was at home. She was heartily glad when the time came to go home, for her head was aching, and she thought joyfully that she would soon be able to restore the hateful bracelet to its place, and the thought made her feel so much better that the, for the first time during the evening, she forgot about it in the laughing excitement of the dressing room while the girls were searching for their rats. She went home with a party of her classmates, and her spirits rising amid all the laughter and chatter, she did not once think of her unlucky adornment until she found herself in her own room. Then, when she had flung off her wraps impatiently and turned up the gas, it was to find the bracelet gone. For a moment, Muriel stared at her arm in a sort of horror. 
It could not be. It was too dreadful to be true. The bracelet had been on her arm in Clara's dressing room the last thing before she put on her wraps. And now it was gone. When she realized it, she gave a little moan of despair. Muriel did not sleep much that night, you may be sure. And she cried a great deal, which did not help matters at all. She was up and dressed early and out before breakfast. Eagerly, she hurried up the street, scanning the pavement until she reached the Howard house and explained the cause of her unseasonable appearance. Clara was not up, but Mrs. Howard listened to Muriel's distracted tale with concern. A thorough search of the dressing room was fruitless. Muriel hunted desperately, and the maids were questioned, but none of them had seen it. They looked through all the rooms and the hall in vain, and then Mrs. Howard shook her head in disappointment. You must have lost it on the street, Muriel, she said. And Muriel, with fast-dropping tears, admitted the likelihood of this and hurried home in despair. Her absence had not been noticed, and she slipped upstairs to her room. Nobody called her, supposing her to be tired of the party. And it was there Flo found her when she and Aunt Marion came home. Why, Muriel, what in the world is the matter? exclaimed Flo, as her sister lifted her flushed, tear-stained face from the pillow. Flo, sobbed Muriel, shut the door and come here. I have something just dreadful to tell you. Oh, Flo, I am in such a scrape and there's no getting out of it. I am so glad you have come home. What will Aunt Marion think of me? And then she sobbed out her remorseful confession. Flo listened in pitying horror. Oh, Muriel! You don't mean to say that you took Aunt Marion's bracelet to wear to the party without asking her. Yes, I did, and I know it was not right, Flo, but I could not stop to think, and I was crazy to wear it. And now it's lost, and what shall I do? I will confess to Aunt Marion right after dinner. It will be awfully humiliating, but I deserve to be humiliated. I feel crushed to the very earth. I've been vain and silly, and I deserve it all. After dinner, Muriel went resolutely to Aunt Marion's room. Aunt Marion was reading by her window, and she looked up with a smile at her pretty niece. Evidently, she had not yet missed her bracelet. Well, dear, come and tell me about your party. Did you have a nice time? No, not a bit, Aunt Marion. I had a horrid time because I did something wrong before I went. I'm very sorry and ashamed, and I have come to confess. And confess she did with a trembling voice and a great deal of choking. Aunt Marion listened in silence. Then she gently drew the girl to her and kissed her. Don't cry, Muriel. I'm not going to scold you. Of course you did wrong, and I'm sorry about the bracelet, but it can't be helped now. If you had asked me, my dear, I would have lent it to you. Oh, Aunt, how good you are. You ought to give me a dreadful scolding. I'm so ashamed of myself, but my repentance won't restore your bracelet. Muriel, called Flo outside the door. Oh, Muriel, she whispered eagerly as the latter appeared. Here is a note from the Howards, and I do believe the bracelet is inside of it. Muriel tore the envelope open with a nervous haste. Out fell a little heap of gold links and a padlock. Flo caught it joyously. What does the note say? It is from Clara, said Muriel. She picked it up last night after we had gone and put it in her own jewel box for safety. She was asleep when I was there, you know, and so could not tell me. Muriel went back to Aunt Marion. Oh, Aunt, here it is, safe and sound. I'm so thankful and relieved, and truly, I'll never feel tempted to do such a thing again. I know what it makes a person feel like, and I'm sure I have learned a wholesome lesson. I think you have, dear, was all Aunt Marion said. And she was right. Muriel was cured of one folly, and she set herself resolutely to work to root out the rest. When her birthday came, Aunt Marion gave her a pretty pin, a golden pansy with a pearl in the center. Muriel Yule thanked her and said, I'll wear it as a reminder, and whenever I feel tempted to envy anyone, or to fret over what I can't have, or to do anything that my conscience does not approve of, I'll look at it and remember the gold link bracelet.